Good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Laver, and I'm a partner at Weber Gallagher, and this is Robert Hanneman, an associate. And today, as part of our Weber Gallagher webinar series for New Jersey Workmen's Comp, we're here to talk to you about temporary total disability and the defenses to the obligation to pay. The first thing that's important to know about temporary disability benefits are how you calculate it and when you pay it. Temporary disability benefits are owed in lieu of wages when an employee has been injured as a result of workers' compensation accident. The first item is how you calculate that. It's important that you generally contact the employer and get 26 weeks of wages prior to the date of accident, and that will give you your average weekly wage. You then calculate 70% of that figure, and that gives you your temporary disability rate. Temporary disability benefits are owed after seven days where an employee has been out of work as a result of a workers' compensation accident. These dates don't necessarily have to be consecutive, and they don't have to be, they would include uh, weekends or holidays, but on the eighth day, you need to pay the temporary disability benefits, and you have to go retroactive to the first date the employee was unable to work. Payments of temporary disability benefits are owed even if a contract for hire has expired. So if an employee is only supposed to have worked for three months for you, and they're out of work as a result of a work accident for more than three months, you still have an obligation to pay temporary disability benefits. Temporary disability benefits are also owed only when an employee is under active medical care. So unlike some of our other states um, where workers' compensation benefits are paid even after the treatment has concluded, here an injured worker is only entitled to temporary disability benefits when under active medical care. Rob's now going to talk about one of our first defenses to the obligation to pay. What we're talking about here today is defenses. Um, when is the carrier still obligated to pay temporary disability? The, the obvious one is, has petitioner reached MMI? And what we mean by the term MMI is maximum medical improvement. Petitioner uh, will not receive any further medical care that will be curative in nature. Uh, Jen will discuss the issues between curative and palliative later. Um, but what we're talking about is the obligation of the employer to pay temporary disability. Once they've reached maximum medical improvement, temporary disability can be ended. Um, the, the following defenses after that are going to talk about when can we terminate temporary disability as long as while petitioner is still receiving authorized medical care. So we're going to discuss some of the defenses with regards to those issues coming up now. Um, if petitioners are still receiving authorized medical care, and the doctor that's providing petitioner the authorized treatment indicates petitioner can return back to work light duty. Uh, light duty means different things to different employers. Some employers have very physically demanding jobs, and there is no light duty capacity for the type of work that's being done. Others allow employees to come back on a, quote, light duty, with, which means they have some restrictions with the type of work they can do, and they are put either in the same position and, and has a, a reduction in the, uh, the activities they do, or um, they're put into a different position uh, that accommodates those light duty restrictions. One of the issues we run into is when petitioners return back to work and the only light duty is a reduction in petitioners' work hours. Um, that really isn't a quote unquote light duty situation. We have case law that, that has recently been um, determined. Uh, it is a judge level decision uh, that addresses this issue. Prior to this, there was nothing in the statute or there was nothing in the um, case law that dealt with uh, a reduction in hours and petitioners still being entitled to temporary disability. We have the Soto versus Hare case. In this particular case, petitioner was injured, suffered an injury to the knee, and was returned back to work by the treating physician on a light duty capacity, but the doctor had only recommended four hours a day so that petitioner can work into getting back to work. Um, once petitioner went back to work, the carrier terminated petitioner's temporary disability because in New Jersey, we don't have any partial temporary disability. And that's really what this case is talking about. In this particular case, petitioner's counsel then um, filed a motion with the court saying his, his client's benefits are being um, terminated uh, unfairly. In this particular case, because petitioner was making such a, a large difference between what he was currently being paid working only four hours a day and what he would have been paid if he had still been receiving temporary disability, the court entered uh, a decision against the respondents in this particular case saying that the respondents should be paying petitioner the difference. 
The difference has to do with um, what petitioner would have earned uh, on temporary disability and what petitioner was actually earning as a net wage from the employer. Now keep in mind that this is only a judge level decision, so the reasoning that Judge Cox had, most of the judges agree with his decision, um, which is one of the reasons why it wasn't appealed. But you have to keep in mind that uh, the exact determination as to partial wages still isn't set by any statute or by the courts as this is just a trial level decision. Correct. With regards to this, the judge really relied upon Section 20. As you can see from the PowerPoint, uh, temporary disabilities are paid in order to allow the injured worker sufficient funds to pay his living expenses. The judge, uh, using the idea of social legislation, said petitioner cannot live on the partial wages he was getting by returning back to light duty and therefore should be paid the difference between what he was making and what he would have earned on temporary disability. And it's also something to keep in mind um, when paying the partial wages want to consider their uh, pre-tax wages compared to their post-tax wages and take that into consideration when deciding SOTO. Um, if it's a case where you have not yet, uh, it, it's not yet filed and you know that there's a partial wage issue, sometimes you may want to consider a um, voluntary tender or you may also want to consider uh, just paying them a compromise, so uh, agreeing to pay an extra certain amount over the period of time because otherwise you have to go week by week to determine exactly how much they were getting paid. So there are ways to compromise this since this is not a, this is, since this is just a trial level decision, you can um, come up with creative ways to compromise the, the partial wage gap. You also have to remember with regards to this decision, this still only applies if the employee is still under active medical care and has not been discharged. If petitioner is discharged from care and is only working four hours a week on a light duty basis and has permanent restrictions, he's not entitled to temporary disability. Um, we're going to move on to the, the, another topic with regards to defenses to the obligation. This is a situation where the carrier's obligation to pay temporary disability benefits uh, has to involve petitioner working two separate jobs. What is the obligation to pay when petitioner has two jobs and can return to one of those jobs? Jen's going to address this issue. So as Rob had said, our third defense is that you're able to cut off temporary disability benefits if an employee has returned to a second job. Uh, there's a recent case now, again, it's a trial level decision, uh, Piquet versus Hickory Ridge Horse Farms, where an employee was injured while working for Hickory Ridge Horse Farms, but they also had another job working for Barnes & Noble. Uh, they were receiving authorized treatment and unable to work, and as a result of that uh, motion, for temporary disability benefits was ordered. After the petitioner was receiving treatment, ultimately he got light duty restriction that he was able to return to work for Barnes & Noble as that job was less strenuous. Upon his return to work for Barnes & Noble, the carrier for Piquet, uh, the carrier for Hickory Ridge Horse Farms decided at that point to terminate the benefits. They, at that point, um, when they terminated the benefits, the petitioner filed a motion to enforce the order. The question was, as we had stated before, whether an employee is entitled to ongoing temporary disability benefits when they've returned to their second job. In this case, Judge French ruled no. The judge ruled that since the petitioner was making at least his temporary disability rate, he was not entitled to temp because the section of the statute 34.15-38 indicates the temporary disability benefits end when an employee is able to resume work. And the judge felt that the fact that he was able to resume work and that the statute didn't say specifically work for the employer for which he's injured, that by returning to work, that was in itself sufficient. Uh, the judge noted that the statute is focused on um, wage, is not focused on wage loss, but actual, um, the fact that they can't return to work. One of the things you have to keep in mind that the Soto case that we just talked about before actually applies in this particular situation also. If petitioner is returned to work at the second job and is making less than the temporary disability rate that they would have been receiving at the other job, the courts may impose the uh, responsibility on the respondent to pay the difference. I'm actually arguing this issue with a, a pending case as we speak. Um, hopefully we'll uh, get the court to agree that uh, with Judge 
French's decision that once petitioner returns to work, there is no obligation to pay temporary disability. But since the Soto decision is a little bit more recent, we're not sure how that's going to play out just yet. Uh, the next issue that we face is when an employee is given light duty restrictions, what now? Can an employer accommodate? What do you do at that point? If an employer can't accommodate, obviously temporary disability benefits need to continue. But if an employer can, com can accommodate, the fourth defense is then that what's discussed. At this point, temporary disability benefits can be terminated if light duty is offered and rejected. And the key is if it's rejected and the employee fails to show up. The burden is on the employer to show light duty work was offered and refused. Additionally, just make sure that when offering a light duty position that you make sure that you do it in writing. Uh, the reason that you do it in writing in addition to a telephone call is because in the case of Harbor Talk uh, versus SNS Furniture, in that case there was a um, petitioner was receiving authorized treatment and he was recommended for surgery. However, the surgery date was several months down the line and as a result the employer um, was told by the doctor that he could work light duty. Uh, when the doctor then prepared, prepared his report, he would then forward it to the adjuster. The adjuster then forwarded it to the employer, contacted the employer, and notified them of the fact that there was light duty uh, restrictions pending the surgery. At that point, the petitioner never did anything. He didn't contact the employer, and he filed a motion to enforce his temporary disability benefits because temporary disability benefits were stopped by the employer. The judge, the trial level judge in that case, had determined that temporary disability benefits were not owed because the employer was able to accommodate light duty and the employee failed to sustain his burden of proof the entitlement to temporary disability benefits were there. However, the employee appealed the case and the appellate court disagreed. They found that the employee did not unjustifiably spurn the offer of a job because the offer was never conveyed to the employee. The employee was never told that there was a position. So again, if you have a light duty restriction and you can accommodate, I would suggest that you first call the petitioner, let them know, call the employee, let them know that there's a job that's there. I'll let them know about what the job is and about the, the job duties. If there's time um, that they should be showing up for the job, let them know that information. But any offer for employment should be sent to the employee by either email or by regular mail. Uh, just make sure whatever type of correspondence uh, you normally have, if it's by text message, that's fine. As long as you have written documentation that you can provide to the judge, if necessary, about an offer for light duty. So it's really important that you do that. We're going to move to another defense with regards to um, the obligation uh, of temporary disability and defense is the same. Uh, if you have a petitioner who's still under authorized medical care, but his return starts or continues with a secondary education, are we still entitled to pay that person temporary disability? Um, the short answer is no. We can terminate temporary disability. Uh, there is a case called Temecki v. Johns Manville. It's an uh, appellate division case from 1973, which is still good law. In this particular case, petitioner suffered a work injury and during treatment returned back to um, full-time academic studies. Petitioner never went back to work, but actually went back to school as a student. In that particular case, petitioner's counsel argued that his client was entitled to temporary disability, quote, because he never returned to work, end quote. In that particular case, the court said um, going back to school as a full-time employee is tantamount to returning to work. It equates to the same thing, therefore you, he's not, uh, in, ob, he, the carrier is not obligated and the petitioner should not be receiving temporary disability if we can show that they've returned to full-time studies. Um, there is another defense that comes up with regards to seasonal employees. Uh, some carriers have employees that are, some employees that only work um, eight or nine months or ten months out of the year. Uh, we cover um, teachers and things like that who only work ten months out of the year. What is the obligation to pay someone who gets a work-related injury and is considered a seasonal employee? Um, are we entitled to pay, uh, or are we obligated to pay temporary disability during the entire year? These are very fact-specific cases. Um, they are only entitled to temporary disability if they can show that but for the work injury, they would have still been doing a summer type of employment 
during the period where they would not have been doing their regular job. The case law that we um, is relied upon in this particular instance is the Outland versus Mammoth Education case. It's a Supreme Court case from 1998. In this particular case, the petitioner was an, a teacher who sustained a, a work, an admitted work accident, um, and during the school year was paid temporary disability. When the summer months came around, petitioner's counsel argued that his client was still entitled to temporary disability. The court initially said yes, petitioner was entitled to temporary disability. An appeal was taken, and the appellate court said no, petitioner is not entitled to temporary disability unless the petitioner can show that um, they were unable to resume work that they would have normally performed in the summer during the, um, and they couldn't due to the work injury. Um, if they can show that they had prior employment and typically did summer employment, then they would be entitled to temporary disability. Now, Rob, what if they never worked ever during the summer, but they wanted to, they said that they wanted to work during this summer, that they had planned to work? Good then. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, we've had a couple cases where that issue has come up. Uh, we've argued that since petitioner was not working, they're not entitled to temporary disability. If they could show that they've applied to jobs, produced documentation from that employer that says, but for the current work limitations, we would have hired the petitioner, then I think the court would have imposed a responsibility on us to pay temporary disability. But unless petitioner is going to go down so far down those steps to actually apply for a job over the summer, and get documentation from the quote new employer that says we can't hire them because of their limitations um, unless they produce that type of documentation. My argument is we, we're not responsible for temporary disability. Um, we're gonna come up to another question on um, one of our defenses is what happens if an injured employee has no restrictions or light duty restrictions and stops showing up for work or decides to retire? Jen's gonna address this one. The next offense is, as Rob had said, what happens when an employee decides to retire? In this instance, if an employee, you may have had where an employee had a retirement date already set up and then lo and behold, they have a work accident and they say to you, well, I still plan on retiring. Well, if a petitioner decides to, to retire, you terminate temporary disability benefits. Uh, the only reason that they're not working and is because they chose voluntarily to remove themselves from the workforce. So in that instance, you do not need to pay temporary disability benefits. So if it's a voluntary retirement, you do not need to pay temporary disability benefits. We would suggest that the retirement be noted in writing and that it be just documented. Everything that we're discussing today, the most important thing that you need to remember is document everything, all these offers, all the situations. This document, have them in writing because it's really important for you to be able to, especially if we're going in front of the judge, the judge wants to say, Where's the documentation that this was offered? Where's the documentation that this is a voluntary retirement? So make sure that you have this information in writing. Jen, what do you, have, what do, you do in a situation if petitioner moves out of state? They're getting authorized treatment and they'd like their treatment to continue. They were working light duty uh, for the employer who was accommodating those light duty restrictions. Now petitioner moves out of state or moves to another area of the state and is no longer working with the employer, um, but is still getting authorized treatment. Again, I would say you terminate temporary disability benefits because you would argue that the employee removed themselves from the workforce. So by moving, when they were working light duty and the employer was accommodating, they now have removed themselves from the workforce. So again, document that you were continuing to employ them light duty and the petitioner is moving out of state and as a result of him moving out of state, he understands that he's going to be terminated as a result of that removal um, and as a result of that, you have written documentation that temporary disability benefits wouldn't necessarily be owed because he removed himself from the workforce by leaving. And at this point, whether or not he had a job is not your problem. We also we also might run into that same issue that we discussed earlier, that if a petitioner does move out of state and then goes, finds an employer who writes him a letter that says, I would have hired him but for uh, his inability to do the light duty or do the restrictions because of his work accident, then we might have an obligation to pay temporary disability. But again, you, you, you would have the obligation uh, to pay temp only if he produced that kind of documentation. And again, I would still always make the argument that temporary disability benefits aren't owed because you were able to accommodate. So as long as you're able to accommodate, the moment that you're not able to accommodate, temporary disability benefits are owed. But if you're still able to accommodate and you have a job offer and the petitioner chooses not to get that job, um, then, that's on, then that's on the petitioner. 
you also have the issue where a lot of times there's um, termination and you may terminate them for reasonable cause. In those instances, it's really important that you contact your attorney, regardless of whether a claim is filed or not, because these are fact-specific issues. Um, it's something that's really important because if you if you fire someone because they fail to show up to work, you could argue that that's abandonment of the job and that they have failed to show up because they uh, that you're terminating them because they're not showing up, and by them not showing up, that has nothing to do with the work injury and you would have been able to accommodate them but for the fact that they stopped showing up for work. So termination in that instance would be appropriate and we would argue that it was an abandonment of a job. Now whether or not the court would absolutely agree with us, there's no specific case law on that specific topic but it's an argument that you need to make. Um, a lot of times as we said these are fact specific cases so feel free to reach out to us if there's a case that you have that's similar um, or you have a different fact pattern and you want our opinion, we'd be more than happy to give you a recommendation as to whether we would recommend terminating temporary disability benefits. Uh, the next obligation uh, to pay, the question that we are asked a lot of time is when an employee is receiving temporary disability benefits and they're unable to receive authorized treatment due to an unrelated cause, so whether it's a pre-existing condition or a non-work related condition, but that this condition prevents them from continuing with their authorized treatment. What do you do? Do you still have to pay temporary disability benefits? Rob's going to talk about the next defense. Right. Only in certain circumstances are we able to stop temporary disability benefits if petitioner is treating for an unrelated condition. Again, uh, as we've indicated throughout this, some of this, these issues are very spe uh, fact specific with regards to these issues. One of the cases that's always referred to is the as you'll see on the PowerPoint, is the Shop First Morristown Memorial um, decided in July of 2010. In this case, Petitioner had a significant cervical injury. Petitioner was scheduled for fusion surgery, but that fusion surgery was delayed as noted for three months due to the employee suffer from unrelated uh, asthma. In that particular case, is the employee due, uh, entitled to temporary disability during that time period that Petitioner was out, even though um, she was unable to continue with authorized treatment? In this particular case, the court held yes. The petitioner was still entitled to temporary disability, and they relied upon a couple issues in this. One, petitioner did not voluntarily stop the treatment or reject the treatment. Petitioner was not non-compliant with the treatment that was being provided under the workers' compensation case. Petitioner in this particular case developed an unrelated issue, and it prevented petitioner from continuing the treatment at that time. Um, I think the fact-specific nature of this case has to do with um, how long is petitioner's condition uh, going to uh, prevent petitioner from um, proceeding with the uh, authorized treatment? Rob, what if it was <clears throat> a situation of a cardiac care? Wouldn't you think that for if someone was treating for a cardiac condition and they're recommended to have surgery and they can't have the surgery due to a cardiac condition, would, would you recommend that you still pay tech in that situation? Actually, I had a situation just like that. In that, in our particular case, petitioner was scheduled for surgery, and as a result of the pre-admission testing, found uh, to have an undiagnosed cardiac condition that prevented petitioner from getting the surgery. The authorized treating physician, we re requested a report from our authorized treating physician, who indicates that because of petitioner's cardiac condition, he could not have the surgery. Um, as a result of saying we terminated temporary disability because at that time there was no further treatment that could be provided to the petitioner. He had already done all, the pal uh, all of the uh, conservative treatment and surgery was only the, the final option. Um, in a situation where it may be just a temporary uh, cardiac issue or another issue, um, again, I would ask the, the, the authorized treating physician to comment on saying to determine whether or not petitioner would be able to undergo the, the recommended surgery. If it's determined that the, the surgery cannot go forward because of the condition, um, then I would say that we're not the petitioner is not entitled to temporary disability. Well, one of the keys, I think, that uh, with regard to these situations is if you have an unrelated condition that's preventing the petitioner from receiving the authorized care, going back to the authorized doctor, letting them know of the situation, and asking them if the petitioner is at MMI as a result of this unrelated condition. If you get the doctor to indicate petitioner is now at MMI. Again, at MMI you can terminate benefits. So that's one of the suggestions that we would recommend in these uh, unrelated conditions. Now if the doctor says that there's, uh, if they did not try conservative care and the doctor is recommending additional conservative care 
for some other type of treatment, then you still may have to pay temporary disability benefits. It also depends on if it's a, a short period of time that the petitioner, as Rob said, would be out of work or if it's a longer or an unknown period of time. In those unknown period of times, that's the key, going back to the authorized doctor, asking them if given the situation of the petitioner's now an MMI, and once you get the MMI, properly terminating the temporary disability benefits. So just keep that in mind when these unrelated conditions pop up. Right. Also, uh, as Jen noted earlier, we can resolve this issue with a with a voluntary tender. Um, if the carrier feels that temporary disability is not due to the petitioner, but there is an argument being made by counsel, we can make a, a voluntary tender to petitioner um, in lieu of paying temporary disability. It can be an unallocated payment. It can be applied to temporary disability in the future if the court determines that petitioner was owed same. And if the court determines the petitioner was not entitled to temporary disability, it can be applied to any permanency disability that may be awarded to the petitioner in the future. So that is always an option with regards to this. It all depends on the counsel you're dealing with and what kind of relationship you have uh, and how forceful they're fighting for temporary disability for their client. Um, one of the last things we're going to discuss is what do you do if treatment seems to never end? Uh, we always seem to have cases like this where the petitioner continues to follow up with the doctor each month or every other month and the doctor's report seems to be the same over and over and over for multiple months. Um, where do we go with that? We're still paying temporary disability because we can't get the doctor to say that petitioner is at MMI. What can we do? Um, Jen's going to address the issue of what the difference between curative and palliative a little bit here uh, at this time. As Robert said, uh, a lot of these cases, it's where uh, an employee is receiving medical management. Um, they, they have this treatment that they're just getting, they're going back to the doctor to get scripts for medications only. Um, they're receiving just this treatment that's ongoing and it, they're not getting any better. The key there is whether or not the treatment is palliative or curative. You still owe temporary disability benefits if there is a curative effect to the treatment. Once the treatment becomes palliative, all you need to do is if the petitioner has been treating for a while, we strongly recommend contacting the doctor and asking them specifically is the treatment palliative or curative? And if it's curative, please explain. But if it's palliative, put that in writing. The second that you get that the treatment is palliative, we suggest that you terminate temporary disability benefits. While the petitioner is still treating, you need to continue to provide the authorized palliative treatment. The reason being that this treatment is needed to keep them at baseline. But it is a basis for you to terminate temp and to move towards permanency. Many times you would want to consider making a uh, voluntary tender in that instance. The, the cases where a person is receiving uh, palliative pain management, you're, you're going to have an award of permanent disability. So in that instance, uh, because the employee, maybe they're applying for social security disability, or maybe they're still looking for work within those uh, light duty restrictions, we would suggest consideration for a VT. Uh, this helps uh, give goodwill. The judges appreciate that you're not just cutting off the petitioner and that you understand that there is going to be permanent disability and that you're trying to help them out so that there's no financial uh, issue with regard to the petitioner. The judges really appreciate that. Uh, just so you know, uh, one of our last webinars um, on August 19, 2016, did actually discuss in more depth the difference between curative and palliative. So if you want to go back and uh, watch that webinar, we would strongly recommend it. It discusses uh, in greater depth the difference between curative and palliative and recommendations on how to go about um, getting the petitioner to MMI. Uh, we also want to tell you about two upcoming programs. There's one on November 22nd uh, with regard to Pennsylvania Workman's Comp, and then another one in New Jersey on December 20th with regard to defending motions for medical and temporary disability benefits. Um, we also just want to remind you that, as we said before, a lot of these cases are fact specific. So if you ever have any questions, feel free to reach out to either Rob, myself, or anyone within the firm, and we can guide you on what we would recommend. We also strongly recommend that um, any communication that you have with the petitioner be backed up in writing, um, especially with regard to these uh, light duty job offers. Make sure that uh, the employee knows that the offer is there and that they're notified of it. Obviously, if there's a return to work full duty, uh, that's on the petitioner. You can terminate ten temporary disability benefits. But in a light duty uh, position being offered, the courts have held, as we've shown you, 
that you must communicate the offer of light duty to the employee. It's the employer's obligation to show that the offer was communicated and the petitioner rejected the offer by either not showing up or when they do show up, they keep leaving. So it's something you need to um, make sure that you're aware of and that you put everything in writing. Remember, you're under an obligation to pay temporary disability, but there are several uh, reasonable bases for terminating SEAM based on the information we've provided you. Uh, obviously, you know, in a brief recap, MMI is, is the most important determination, uh, but after that, while petitioner is still getting authorized treatment, um, paying attention to, the, to what's going on with petitioner's care and treatment on a regular basis and getting the updated records from the carrier, uh, from the doctor, is a very important step in making sure that we can move forward with the case and not having the respondent and, and the carrier pay more than their own fair share. Um, thank you very much. We appreciate you um, watching, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to either of us or anyone from the firm. Have a nice day.